Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm Ashmaster Flash, and today we're going to cover inexpensive coordinated GSM anomaly detection. Uh, more specifically, what that means by inexpensive, um, the whole goal of the project was to come up with something that was going to be far less expensive than the production of a malicious device. Um, coordinated, meaning centrally configured, you don't want to have to pull SD cards on a whole bunch of remote sensors and then reconfigure them, reburn them, and, and get them back out into the field. So central configuration and software management was really important. And by anomaly detection, uh, specifically what we mean is picking up uh, rogue BTSs and IMSI catchers. So let's jump in. Uh, a little about me. I started uh, with actually getting paid for technology at work around 2000. And I hopped uh, disciplines every few years, kind of changed focus. And now I'm working in R&D for a cloud workload security company. And I don't like talking about me, so that's where we're going to end that. Let's talk about you. Uh, my, the audience I was writing this for uh, has a background in systems and network engineering, um, some interest in GSM threat detection, but probably not a huge depth. I mean, if you've got it, then great, but it's not required. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the crib notes so we can make it through. And tinfoil hat's certainly not required, but it's not unwelcome. So go ahead and put it on now, and, uh, and let's party. Uh, so I said that I'm working R&D now. I really love my job, and as such, I, uh, this has nothing to do with my day job. So if you don't like this, if you do something with this and get in trouble, I completely disavow whatever it is that you do with this. So um, yeah, and don't go talking to my boss about this. Just come talk to me if you don't like it. <laughs> uh, so, so here's what we're going to cover. Uh, first off, why you should care. Uh, the current threat and detection landscape the original project goals, two iterations of the sensor, and the service architecture, because it's kind of a split architecture, set up uh, future plans for the project, and that's where I kind of beg you for your help and full requests. Uh, uh, nod and a hat tip to prior art, and Q and A. Why should you care? Because invasions of privacy are bad even when they're unnoticed. Yeah, that's true, and this all is, is kind of vague, so specifically what are we looking at? Um, what's the worst that could happen with a compromised cell phone conversation in your CFO's office? Uh, it could have a financial impact on your company. Um, in the right CFO's office, you could even be looking at something like uh, insider trading or market manipulation with the right phone conversation. So um, these devices are so small and so easy to hide and so inexpensive, you know, can you really trust your ficus? Adjust your tinfoil hat. Uh, <laughs> And the second side of this is it's uh, with an IMSI catcher, you can also determine uh, whether or not a specific person is within a domicile. So if uh, with one of these devices, someone could walk up outside of your house and they could get a listing of all IMSI numbers. Now, IMSI numbers are the ones that are burned into your SIM in your phone. That's attached to your account. So that identifies you as an individual. Uh, if you can take a listing of those from everybody inside of a house, process of deductive reasoning, you can determine who is home. So it's a little bit spooky, and, uh, and it's not that expensive to carry off. Uh, the terminology, uh, baseline for the talk. Uh, Software-defined radio. Uh, I had one of those in my pocket, but I gave it away. Uh, the, um, it's using software to perform your signal analysis and using a uh, typically a USB dongle that has a, a software-controlled tuner. And in the case of this, we're using the RTL SDR device as a super Super cheapo, like $20, $40 units. Um, ARFCN, absolute radio frequency channel number. I may just refer to that as channel number from here on out, given that this is in the GSM in-depth talk, um, just because it's easier to kind of wrap your head around. Think of this almost like a television channel. Uh, CGI, cell global ID, is a globally unique identifier for the BTS um, that's comprised of a mobile country code, a mobile network code, a location area code, and a cell ID. All that comes from the BTS. And like I said earlier, the IMSI is what's burned into your SIM, and that's what identifies you as an individual. Here's a visual aid to kind of wrap your head around GSM addressing in regards to the global cell ID. Um, every mobile country code has a number of subordinate mobile network codes. Within that, you have multiple location area codes, and within that, you have multiple cell IDs. So let's talk about threat and detection. So we'll go over 
first a drink of water. Uh, malicious devices, how you know that these malicious devices are in play, and what's currently on the market to detect them. So Hack Femto Cell is a trusted part of the provider's network. We saw some really good talks in DEF CON 21 about you know, hacking, uh, hacking Femto Cells uh, for the purpose of honest IDS and also for some nefarious purposes. With a hacked Femto Cell, you can gather IMSIs and you can also record phone calls and SMS traffic uh, that are going across it. Your phone has no idea if it's good or evil, your phone is just going to attempt to attach to it. And Evil BTS, um, Evil Socket had a great blog post on how to build one for very, very cheap. Um, and ham hands for scale, this is the size of the SDR that's necessary to build a, um, you could, you could kind of see how this could fit in your ficus, right? Okay. So, and that's the largest device in the system. So that coupled with a Raspberry Pi 3, you can build a, uh, an evil BTS and record phone and SMS traffic. Again, this is the same case with the, uh, with the femto cell. Your phone doesn't know if it's good or evil, it's just gonna try and talk to it. That's a GSM thing. So indicators of attack. How do you know when something weird's going on? Uh, ARFCN, remember, think of it like a TV channel. All of a sudden, if a channel goes loud over threshold, this is something you determine by a short period of observation. Uh, so you can set a threshold, alert when it gets over that. Uh, ARPs and outside of, far, out of forecast, um, you can use, here's spoiler alert, we're using graphite in part of this, and graphite has, uh, has Holt-Winter's algorithm built in so that you can uh, have a confidence band over time. And so if something that's typically low but all of a sudden gets a little bit louder, it may not be a threat to you, but it may be something nearby. Um, a channel all of a sudden getting louder may indicate that someone's trying to broadcast on the same channel. Uh, unrecognized cell global ID. Uh, there are databases you can download with the GPS coordinates and all the, all the metadata for the cell global IDs. And it's useful for determining your location. If you don't have a GPS chip, you can kind of make that determination based on where the tower is. Um, gratuitous BTS reassociation. This is something that you would determine by observing the, beh the behavior of a cell radio. And if all of a sudden you have a stationary radio that starts associating to another BTS or another, a bunch of other BTSs, typically for a, for a standard or a, um, a stationary radio, you're not gonna see a lot of that behavior. If you're walking around, it's supposed to happen like that with your cell phone, but if it's sitting in one place, you really shouldn't be hopping towers a whole heck of a lot. And if you have the GPS location of a tower by the cell global ID, and the BTS um, is broadcasting a cell global ID of something that should be in, say, Orlando, if that cell shows up in Vegas, either someone's absolutely awful at their job of configuring BTSs, or it may be something malicious. So current detection methods, uh, both Pony Express and Bastille Networks have an offering of which this is a subset. Um, open source options. Uh, Fake BTS is a really cool project. It served as the original inspiration for this. It's a, it's a collection of shell scripts that use Wireshark and Airprobe and Calibrate to make a determination as to whether or not you have uh, malicious nearby cells. Uh, the Android IMSI Catcher Detector is software that you install on your phone itself and it interacts with your cell phone's radio to determine if there's any sort of anomalous behavior. And Femto Catcher is very close in function to I to the Android IMSI catcher detector, but it's specifically for catching femto cells and it's really only effective for um, phones on Verizon Wireless's network. The original project goals. Um, I, it's Vegas, I think it's okay to ask what you can get for $100. So, <laughs> um, so that was the goal, is see if I can get the target price under $100 for the first iteration. Uh, I wanted a low footprint. For the raw materials, I wanted it to be at least as small as this. And uh, functional targets, I wanted to be able to um, pretty much use the indicators of attack as a metric on whether or not I would be successful detecting rogue uh, BTSs. And centrally managed software and configuration. That was really important to me because I have really big hands and it is such a pain to actually get those micro SD cards into the right slot 
in a Raspberry Pi, and I've lost so many and gotten so frustrated having to crack the case back open to get my, yeah, it's, I didn't even want to screw around with that. I wanted to be able to drop this thing under a desk, uh, behind a ceiling tile, pretty much wherever you might find a malicious device, I wanted to drop this thing so that you could get good local coverage inexpensively <laughs> and not have to touch it again. Um, in the process of this, I collected a lot of hardware. Uh, I had a Raspberry Pi 2, a logarithmic antenna, a couple of Odroids, a C1 Plus and an XU4, a galaxy of red and blue and green and orange LEDs, an Intel NUC, an Intel Edison, a GSM modem, a handful of RTL SDR devices. I didn't really need all this stuff, but when you get locked into a serious hardware collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you possibly can. <laughs> So, that brings us to Sitch, situational information from telemetry and correlated heuristics. And I definitely started with the acronym side of that before I came up with the words to match. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the first iteration of the sensor. The, uh, I had an RTL SDR device, I wrote a, a um, wrapper in Python to get that into structured data uh, using Calibrate, and all of that feeds into the main process, uh, also running GPSD to pull uh, accurate GPS readings from a GPS dongle, using Logstash 4 to, to forward scan logs. Since we have it in structured format, it's pretty easy to drop the file, and Logstash picks that up, shoots it off to Logstash, Elasticsearch, all that good stuff in the cloud. And, um, and I was using a tool, a uh, Python tool, called Graphite Send to send all this stuff over an OpenVPN uh, channel up to a uh, Graphite instance for tracking time series measurements, which was, uh, it was effective enough. I, uh, I talked Verizon into sending me a femtocell to set up in my apartment, and, uh, and when you start it up, I mean, they never really consistently start at the same speed. Sometimes you'll be waiting for 40 minutes for it to get a GPS fix, but when it does go live, it's pretty plain to see. Um, honestly, this graph is a little bit smoothed out. It's normally spikier than this. I went back in history and graphite, and graphite had already kind of smoothed things out for me but it's very clear, very apparent when this stuff goes live uh, because it gets very loud and your phone attaches to it and then, ta-da, you're on a part of Verizon's trusted network. So, remember that slide earlier? Uh, here it is in table form. So these are our functional targets. Arfson over threshold is a big yes as well as Arfson outside of forecast, but the tool that we're using called Calibrate, what it does is it produces a list of uh, channels, nearby channels, and gives you a power rating is typically used for picking up, um, for determining your clock offset because uh, SDR devices are notorious for being drifty and the RTL SDR devices are especially notorious depending on temperature. So those are the sense that you actually can't get away with running those things with the lids closed. They get way, way too hot. Um, and the price was $100, like it was right at about $100. Not counting the case, I mean the case was kind of necessary. For the, uh, for the trip out here, but uh, just the raw components you can get for about $100, and it's, it's pretty effective. The problem is you're looking at about seven minutes worth of uh, resolution, so it takes seven minutes to scan 850 megahertz GSM using a Raspberry Pi 2, and you can actually have kind of a, a pretty important conversation in less than, you know, in less than seven minutes. So, good first iteration, I was thinking, ah, I got, this actually happened after I submitted my CFP, I was able to kind of prove what I was thinking. And um, so this is like late April, and I was thinking, ah, I could kind of roll with this, just write on this, and maybe it'd be fine and cool. And, uh, and I started looking at the source code, and I was really, really not happy with it. <laughs> it was pretty horrific, and that's just not me being self-conscious. There were a few problems with this. So what's wrong with Mark 1? Um, main was single-threaded. And when you're pulling data from two separate devices, you can end up with some interesting situations if you've got to wait on your GPS to get a fix, and then you do your seven minute scan of 850 megahertz GSM, then it's, it's this sort of, sort of additive problem. It, it's, uh, you can really end up with some kind of ridiculously long scan times, especially if you're indoors trying to get a GPS fix. Another thing I didn't like is that there were two secure channels for delivering the information. That's, it's inefficient, it's just more crap to manage, and I really kind of wanted to reduce those to, to one encrypted channel. 
So, now I'm going to start the demo, and I'm going to start it early in the presentation because it takes a, um, this stuff is kind of bandwidth dependent. So, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that. Check this out. Is this thing on? <laughs> All right. So, this has got a RTL SDR device, a GSM radio, it's a Raspberry Pi 2, and, uh, and just some stuff to support that. So, and this thing's being provisioned from zero using the uh, orchestration stuff I was talking about. So while we're waiting on this thing, uh, what it's doing is there's a, the service that I'm using to orchestrate what I'll loosely call firmware, although maybe we'll have a discussion on the actually what firmware is later. Um, I'm going to call it firmware. It's just a bunch of Python code. But the, um, what actually sits on the device, there's a service called Resin. And uh, Resin has built an image to put on your Raspberry Pi that runs Docker. Uh, I think, I can't remember the version of Linux. I'm, that's based on, I'm not going to promise something up here. But what it does is it dials home to the service um, and it pulls uh, Docker images of whatever you commit. So basically what you do, this is what your deployment pipeline looks for using uh, Sitch and Resin. So what you have, your actual user effort is you do a git commit of your code, you do a git push to Resin's repository, everything below the orange bar is all managed by Resin. If your build completes, uh, and I'd like to mention that if you do not do unit testing, you are going to hate your life. You will pull your eyeballs out of your head because it takes a few minutes and it's almost like, hey, here's Python, but now I have to compile it and wait and wait. So um, get good at unit testing and then make that part of your commit. Um, the, the commit hook will run a Docker build on your code and if your build is successful, it'll accept the commit and moves the image into Resin's registry. And then your device will, it, it pulls like every minute to the resin service and when you have a new container image, it just pulls down a new container image and restarts. And you don't have to touch the thing to do software updates, which is really nice if you're sticking these things up in attics and all over the place. So, as far as service side software goes, um, we've talked a lot about what's actually running on the sensor and what's running on the service side uh, most people in here, if you're a sysadmin, you're probably familiar with Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. It's a great, fantastic open source tool, and it's super versatile. It's a part of this, uh, as well as using Carbon and Graphite for time series uh, database and for statistical calculation. And I'm using Tessera because uh, I, as much as I love Graphite, Graphite's graphs are really not pretty. You need something to go on top of it. And um, Graphite Beacon is probably the simplest tool I found for just measuring and looking for things outside of bounds on graphite. It was so nice that somebody didn't over-engineer something. It's simple. You can figure it, set it up, and fire it off. Um, so that's what I chose. Vault is a really cool tool from HashiCorp. And, um, and what it does, it does secret management. So you can load certs, you can load uh, credentials in there, and you use and we have the keys for accessing those loaded up into environment variables in the device itself. So you can do your credential rotation against Vault, and then you just bounce your whole application you know, through the resin user interface, and everything comes back up, gets its credentials, and all those credentials are written on the sensor to a, um, to a RAM disk, so that if somebody does jerk the power, it's at least a little more difficult. I know, you know with, with physical contact, all of your security should be considered null, but at least it makes it a little bit more difficult to uncover your uh, your crypto material. Resin is the service that I use to manage the software. And Slack is where the notifications come out, you know, because at least you can do it over IP and you're not relying on SMS when GSM may or may not be, you know, a friendly area. So on the service architecture side, um, 
Uh, the first thing the information hits is the inbound information processor. What that is in this case is uh, Logstash. Uh, document retention, everything's stored in structured data in Elasticsearch, and the web-based portal is uh, kind of a combination of Kibana and Tessera. Uh, the time series database is Graphite, and analysis and alert generation right now are shared by um, Graphite, I'm sorry, um, that other tool, Graphite Beacon, <laughs> and some stuff that's coming directly out of the sensor. The sensor is actually smart enough to do some alerting on its own, and that stuff is caught by Logstash, and it kicks it out straight to Slack. Uh, like I said, an external alerting service is Slack, and there's a the user. So the intelligence feed, uh, if you're going to make a determination on, um, you know, on the location of all of these GSM towers, you don't want to do your own site survey and then compile your own database. You really kind of want to look and see if somebody else has already done that. The Open Cell ID database is out there, and it's super useful. The only thing I think it didn't contain that I really wanted was the carrier name, because you can make that determination using the MCC and MNC parts of the Cell Global ID. Uh, so thank God for Twilio and their free pricing API, because you can just pull all of that stuff down. API key is free. And the way that this works is it's all because once you start using Docker for something, you just want to use it for everything. And, um, and so I have this Docker container that I can run as a job. And it goes out, it pulls down the Open Cell ID database, it merges that with the information of the Twilio pricing API, and it throws this stuff out into files based on MCC. The reason that's sliced up is because that database file is so huge uh, that you want to have this kind of broken up. And uh, knowing the company, country that you're operating in, you should be able to determine the uh, mobile country codes that you need to be downloading for. So it reduces the, the download size, uh, but truth in advertising is as much as I want this live demo to work, it is a lot of information, and maybe or maybe it won't be able to download everything in time. If it doesn't, I've got a, I've got a video, and I'm sure this probably wouldn't be the first time a live demo fell over at DEF CON. <laughs> so, oh, if you insist. So let's talk about the Mark II sensor and, uh, and kind of the improvements I wanted to make before I showed anybody this, this ugly baby of mine. Um, so there's a component, uh, the SIM 808 collector. Um, that interacts with a GSM modem to actually function in, some, in a way that's somewhat similar to the way the Android IMS eyecatcher detector works uh, by interacting with your phone's uh, GSM components. So, the, uh, so everything that you see in green is its own thread off of the main process. So that way you can, you can concurrently run collections against your GSM modem as well as your RTL SDR device so that you don't have to wait seven minutes and then do it, you know, it's just decided to forego all of that. Um, everything that you see in blue is a first in, first out buffer. So all of this scan information goes into the enrichment buffer and the enricher thread picks it up. Enricher thread uh, compares that against the enrichment database that you pull down based on the MCC file. Yes, the MCC file uh, that comes down that's, all that stuff gets shoved up into AWS. It doesn't have to work like that. It'd be simple enough to tool around to work off of an HTTP server, but AWS was just easier, so that's what I did. Um, and the emitter uh, can emit straight to scan logs, uh, which are picked up by Logstash Forwarder, or you could point it off to um, to the Logstash server itself, I felt a lot more comfortable having it work with Logstash Forwarder because Logstash Forwarder can run its own buffer if you end up with loss of communication. It just seemed like the smarter thing to do to not have everything just pipelined up in memory on one of these small little devices. And everything goes up to Logstash over that single channel, no longer using OpenVPN, and uh, Logstash has some great output plugins that you can use to take that structured information that's coming in and spit it right out to Graphite. So kind of coalescing those two paths was super, super, uh, it just makes things seem simpler to me. So this is kind of a, a block diagram of what goes on inside the sensor. Uh, for a calibrate scan, everything goes, um, it goes into the enricher thread, or enricher thread picks it up from Q, and, um, and it can fire alerts on its own um, based on a threshold that you set in the environment variables in Resin. Resin is the service that manages it, pushes out environment variables for running your program. 
Um, so you can set a device specific threshold depending on where in the building it is because you don't want to set the same, I mean that's, that wouldn't work. Um, and it also sends individual events or individual uh, structures for ARFs and metadata and the original scan document containing your timestamp, all that other good stuff. It's a little more interesting when you start pulling from the SIM 808 module, which is your GSM modem. Uh, the enricher thread gets it, does a comparison against the enrichment database, which is kind of sizable, but it does do a little in-memory caching for a little while, just so you don't have to keep hitting disk for everything that, that comes through. And it can set, it can do alerts on changes in the primary cell global ID. It can do alerts on the cell global ID not being in database, and it can also do alerts on the cell global ID uh, not being in range based on the geolocation that's coming down through the feed. Um, what I kind of want to draw your attention to is this calculation is actually happening on the Raspberry Pi, so the idea is that you should be able to stand this stuff up and, um, and have a fairly small compute overhead compared to some other services, because a lot of the compute's happening on the device itself, uh, so doing stuff like geospatial calculations, stuff like that, you don't have to do all of that stuff because the, um, something I failed to mention earlier, remember I said that there's about a seven minute delay on getting results with an RTL SDR device. When you throw one of those little GSM devices into engineering mode, it's every few seconds you get a list of all of your um, nearby cells by preference according to the GSM. So. Uh, the RTL SDR device is more of an objective observation. I see these channels, here's the power. But you're interrogating the GSM modem actually tells you what it prefers. So the stuff that's a little more GSM heavy, of why do I prefer this tower over another, takes care of all of that and you can just query the GSM modem and ask it, what do you prefer the most? And you can tell when your primary changes and you cut the resolution from around seven minutes down to just a few seconds. Woo! Uh, so this is what you see in Slack when, uh, you know, after the thing gets, gets started and gets warmed up. Uh, these alerts are for things, you know, like not being in the feed database, other stuff like that. And you also get alerts for um, graphite beacon when you have problems with uh, anomalies being detected when things fall outside of the forecasted expectation for your time series measurements. So, here's where we return to the demo and see if these things are actually going to behave for us. So, I don't think I get a drum roll up here, but it's, I, I hope you can, I hope the anxiety is palpable. Woohoo! Let me just truck this over there. Sorry, this is... Somebody told me not to do it like this, and if I'd have had enough sense to listen. <laughs> what? All right. Yeah, thanks. I'll probably need that. Where did you go? All right. So. Two down to 12. Every failure goes down to three. Here in a minute, you're going to have me some Jack Daniels, and I'll know I just need to walk off stage. <laughs> Let's try mirroring for the win. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so it actually was able to download all of the feed database and everything. I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> Live demo, y'all. All right, so this is what it looks like um, in resin. And with resin, you can um, actually, okay, truth in advertising. One of these <laughs> I plugged in in the speaker's green room just because I was afraid that it wouldn't have enough time to download all of the things. And the one that I plugged up a few minutes ago, let's see how far along it is. This one's called Misty Mountain. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so. Yep, still downloading. Uh, depending on bandwidth, I mean, it can take a little while. The initial download, so you've got a couple of minutes at the beginning. When you pop in the SD card, it reformats it to work right for, uh, for Resin's operating system. And then it dials home to Resin's service, and it starts pulling your Docker image down. Um, 
This is actually a lot smaller. Originally, I tried doing this with uh, GNU Radio, and oh my god, that thing <laughs> is a monster. So you start dealing with image sizes over two gigs, and Raspberry Pis struggle with it. Um, it is my hope that someday that I can get GNU Radio trimmed down enough, because I think that, and especially the uh, GNU Radio GSM project, uh, Peter Kreisick uh, put that together. So if you're looking for something fun to play around with, I highly recommend that. I was hoping to get that originally worked into this, but I think ARM's going to have to get a little bit more powerful with the stuff that you can buy off the shelf before we'll actually be able to get GNU Radio working at least the way that I need for, for this project. But check out GRGSM if you have a minute. It's, it's some awesome stuff. Now let's go back to the working sensor. All right. So in the startup process, you see download the application, installing the application, um, pulls everything down from the, uh, from the feed, gets your secrets from, uh, from the vault. Yeah, this one started up just fine. Oh man, that's great. <laughs> not, it's, it's not that I thought that it would really not work, but superstition, you know, the same reason you don't do a, do a change window on a Friday afternoon. So to Sarah, let's see what that looks like. Let's see if we have anything for DEF CON yet. And we do have a little bit. So these are time series measurements. And it, honestly, it looks a little ugly. This is probably due to my configuration of graphite. Um, let's find a resolution that looks decent. There we go. That's a little bit better. And you can see the, uh, the channels that are being tracked by Arfson. And this is coming the RX level. This is a measurement that's produced by the cell radio itself. Uh, here's, yeah, this is the whole winner's anomaly stuff. This doesn't get really interesting until you actually have a measurement period by which you can start to look at, because uh, Holt, Holt winner's is super cool. You could probably do this with standard deviation, but I was, oh, Holt winner's, it's a bigger word, right? And it's free. It's already baked in. There's another buzzword if anybody's playing bingo. Um, so Holt Winters is super cool in that it takes seasonality into it. So if you, not that you would ever see this in the real world, um, but, um, but if you have like, if Monday afternoons are really hot, you know, then it'll, it'll accommodate for that. You just have to let it see a Monday afternoon or else you get that. So we're even tracking the affinity, which looks like it may have made a change. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, so the cell made an affinity change shortly after coming online, which is pretty cool, from Arfson 180 to something higher than that. Uh, 238. Yeah, that's cool. Anyway, we're all kind of discovering this. I was, honestly, I was pretty afraid of turning this thing on at DEF CON and blowing up the service by throwing so much information into it, but it's behaved surprisingly well. So let's see. And here is my Kibana server. Oh, no results yet. And that's because my time range is crap. All right. There's that. Let's trim that down a little bit to two hours. And there you can see we started getting stuff coming through. and scans of all type. And this is all structured data, so if you wanted to build something on top of it just to interrogate uh, Elasticsearch and pull these results out, go nuts. All this stuff is gonna be released open source after the talk, so I hope that somebody out there enjoys this thing after how much time I spent doing it. So let's return to the demo and see if I can figure out this mirroring thing again. All right, so summary of Mark 1 and Mark 2 functionality. Um, so like we discussed earlier, uh, ARPS and over threshold and outside of forecast worked great with the first one. It was just really slow to return results. Seven minutes, you've already told them your, your stock trading tips and somebody else has them too. Um, with the Mark II, we hit all of our objectives. Uh, ARPSN over threshold and outside of forecast, of course, because we were still using Calibrate. 
uh, unrecognized cell global ID. We're able to pick that up, gratuitous BTS reassociation. We're able to pick that up as well. Uh, BTS detected outside of range, you can do that as well. Um, and the price was uh, 150 bucks. So considering that um, this, if you buy this at list price, not the price, like they've got a great deal in the vendor booth, you should all go and buy one. These are so expensive and they've got a great deal running in the vendor booth. They didn't pay me to say that. Um, <laughs> but um, with one of these, um, yeah, I, I think you're looking at maybe around 600, $650 with this, a Raspberry Pi, a GSM radio. You can build an evil BTS for about 150 bucks. You can build a, um, a sensor to detect when these things are around. So the original goal of having something that was uh, easy to deploy, you know, something, I mean, you just pop the SD card in, make sure everything's plugged up, you ship it out, plug it up wherever, and leave it alone, let it collect its stuff. Uh, to have it less expensive than the, uh, than the evil devices, um, I'd, I'd call it a win. So there's that. Uh, going forward, this is what I kind of like to do with it. Automatic device detection. Something I shielded you guys from was all the environment variables you have to configure. Some of them you want to have to configure, you know, like what is, what is the, you know, the, the key to retrieve all of my information from Vault, right? You don't want just your search just hanging out there. So, so there's that. I'd like to do device and service heartbeats because right now that's something that you just kind of have to infer because uh, you'll start getting graphite alarms. Um, but it's really something you just have to infer. I'd like to get more specific with that. Uh, GNU Radio, like I said earlier, I would love for GNU Radio to be the core of this if I could figure out a way to make it run quickly and, uh, and uh, honestly to run it all on a Raspberry Pi because uh, running that sample rate and doing GSM processing is, uh, is pretty intense. Um, but if you do go pure SDR, then not only GRGSM, but you can start playing around with ADSB broadcasts from aircraft, uh, looking up uh, FPV, FPV drones, all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, maybe even running connectors for Ubertooth 1 and Yardstick 1, because those are, you know, those are some kind of fun things to play around with. And if you can just, if you never have to touch the thing except to install new hardware, eh, why not, right? So here's a hat tip and thanks to our prior art. Uh, DIY cellular IDS and traffic interception and remote mobile cloning with a compromised femtocell. Uh, that served as the original ins inspiration that kind of got me thinking in this direction because you can get a femtocell for 250 bucks or you can social engineer one out of Verizon for pretty, I've been with you guys for so long. If, if that argument has never worked before, it worked for me. I've been your customer for so many years and I have crap reception in my little apartment. Um, so 250 bucks or 600 bucks, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cheap to, to be able to do some, some positively evil things. And last year, uh, Duckahuna and Satan Claus put on a great intro to SDR in the Wireless Village. It was a one-on-one -on -one track that, uh, that I really enjoyed and kind of set me down the road of, of trying to figure this, this problem out. Uh, Fake BTS is served as the original functional inspiration for this, kind of the interaction between Wireshark and Airprobe and unfortunately, it's a little too intense to run on ARM, so that's why I kind of had to write my own little hack together thing. Um, and how to big build your own rogue GSM BTS for fun and profit. Simone Margaritelli, thank you. If Evil Socket is here, I want to buy you a beer. If you're not, I owe you one. Um, it was a really well written blog post on how to simply set up an Evil BTS using one of these and a Raspberry Pi 3 and a battery pack and a GSM radio. And that helped me to kind of quantify the price and the footprint and uh, ease of access for parts. So thank you, uh, Evil Socket. That was, a, that was a huge help for this talk and, and gave me a really good solid, solid target to shoot for. Um, thanks, uh, GNU Radio is, you know, as much as I wish it could have made it in here, it actually worked pretty well on the Intel NUC, but those things are kind of pricey. You, you were not gonna beat anybody on price using an Intel NUC. But, uh, but GNU Radio runs pretty well on that for this purpose. And uh, Peter Kreisick was really helpful, helping me to get up to speed on the, uh, on the GSM stuff. And Calibrate uh, calibrates the core of this. And without Calibrate, it really probably wouldn't work very well. So hat tip and thanks to all of the prior art. And thanks to all these fools. John Minerick made a not small investment in test hardware. He was one of my first beta testers. So John, if you're out there, thanks a bunch. Maybe not. Uh, Gillis Jones, super helpful. Great advice. Uh, 
Christian Wright and Dave Doolin suffered through this thing. <laughs> and, uh, and there were a lot of silent contributors who didn't necessarily want to be associated with a DEF CON talk. But I don't know why. I have no problem with it. But, um, but I got a really use, bunch of really useful information on, uh, on GSM networks from some, uh, some really helpful people in the background. Anyway, um, we can do Q&A now or we can take it off stage. Yep, I'm going to release it as, as soon as I get to a reasonably secure network. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, on your DEF CON CD, there's a white paper with the links in it. Alternatively, my handle is ashmasterflash. Check me out on Twitter, and, um, and I'll post there, and I may see if I can get, squeeze an email through full disclosure as well. Ashmasterflash. <laughs> Two A's. All right, thanks a whole bunch, everybody.